This program is brought to you by Emory University. So it is my pleasure this morning to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Joe Sia, uh, one of my colleagues over at Midtown uh, in the structural heart <coughs> and valve uh, imaging. So uh, Dr. Sia, originally from Saline, Michigan, uh, went to the University of Michigan for, for undergrad, one of our many uh, Michiganers uh, ties here at, at Emory. University of Toledo for med school and then residency at the University of Colorado uh, before joining us here at Emory in the clinical research pathway, worked with Dr. Leslie Shaw, uh, where he got his master's uh, of science in clinical research, and then on to clinical uh, here, where he was a chief fellow, and then did a structural imaging fellowship uh, with myself for a year, and then came on as faculty in August of 2020. So, you know, he wears many hats here. Uh, he, he rounds in the CCU, both at, at Clifton and at Midtown, but, uh, uh, definitely a huge part of our structural imaging program and, and, and a big reason why we've been able to grow so much at Midtown with our cardiac CT program. So he's going to give us uh, an insights here into the current state of cardiac CT. So Dr. Sia, I'll have you take the floor. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks for uh, tuning in today. And thanks, Patrick, for those uh, kind words. I'll uh, Venmo you later for that. Um, I have no disclosures. So we'll first start off with um, a brief history of cardiac CT, followed by uh, what the guidelines say in terms of indications for ordering a cardiac CT. We'll spend the bulk of the presentation on how we actually use cardiac CT uh, here at Emory, and then uh, we'll kind of wrap up and I'll give you guys an overview of what our infrastructure looks like for our CT program across uh, all of our different sites. So starting off with a brief history, um, so the commercial CT scanner was introduced in 1971 by Sir Godfrey Hounsfield. Uh, the first scan was actually a scan done of uh, a patient's brain. Um, what's interesting about this is that he worked for a company at that time called uh, EMI, or Electrical and Musical Industries. And EMI was a big British conglomerate, um, and they had multiple divisions, including a large research and development division for which Sir Hounsfield worked in it. But probably what they were better known for was that they were also a record label. And um, their most famous band signed under their group was actually the Beatles. And so the story is that the Beatles, in, in selling you know, millions and millions of their records, uh, actually uh, helped uh, the research and development of what we know as CT today. So there have been multiple generations and upgrades to CT uh, throughout the decades. Um, the CT scanner that it's still in use today, the 64 slice scanner was introduced in the early 2000s. Um, and we still see this in smaller uh, hospitals and community settings. The um, CT, scans that we, CT scanners that we have at Emory and some of these larger institutions across the country and across the world uh, are, are, were actually introduced almost 15 years ago. Here's, here's some examples of what CT used to look like, 3D reconstructions with electron beam CT. Here's a very early on single slice CT for which it actually took four to five seconds for the camera to actually rotate uh, around the patient. So you can imagine that the picture quality for looking at the coronary arteries was uh, suboptimal at that time. And then that progressed to four slice CT, 16 slice CT, 64 slice CT, and you can see the improvements in image quality to finally where we are at this day and age, where we get these beautiful 3D reconstructions of the coronary arteries. Um, and so you can see the difference between a 64 slice CT and its coverage of the heart versus a 320 slice CT, which can capture the heart in one rotation. Um, and this is the scanner that we actually use um, at Emory Midtown. Uh, the other uh, campuses have a different type of scanner that has prioritized faster rotation in order to optimize their temporal resolution based on having two camera heads. So what do the guidelines say about um, ordering cardiac CT? Well, there's a ton written about calcium scores, obviously. Uh, there's also a lot written about coronary evaluation. And I'll talk about the coronary evaluation here in a second. Um, but there's far less written about 
when to order CT for the purposes of evaluating cardiac structure and morphology. There's a very old uh, appropriate use criteria from 12 years ago that was very vague and basically gave cardiac CT an A or an appropriate indication for basically anything related to cardiac structure and function. But I, I want to first talk about, um, spend a couple of minutes uh, kind of showing you guys how the uh, guidelines have changed with regards to coronary CTA over time. So for many years, and this is from the 2012 guidelines on stable ischemic heart disease, CT, coronary CTA was really an afterthought compared to some of the other uh, modalities for evaluating patients with chest pain. Coronary CTA was given a class 2B uh, recommendation for patients who were able to exercise and a 2A for patients who were unable to exercise, whereas stress echo, nuke were all class one. And a lot of the reason for that was because the knock on coronary CT has always been um, its uh, specificity. Um, it's a great uh, rule out test, uh, but not so good as a rule in test or as people used to say. And so if you look at these pictures, you can pretty easily tell if someone has either normal coronary arteries or they have mild non-obstructive disease it's also fairly, uh, you can also say with, with a good amount of confidence if someone has severe uh, coronary artery stenosis. But it's for the patients who are in this middle category for which um, you know, coronary CTA uh, does encounter some problems. But since those guidelines, there have been m uh, several randomized controlled trials that have compared coronary CT to um, standard of care, which is functional testing. In the early 2010s, uh, this, was, this was usually uh, in the ER population with patients with acute chest pain, and then the mid-2010s, late 2010s are in patients who have stable uh, chest pain. Not to get into the weeds, because um, uh, it's a little bit beyond the, the purpose of this talk, um, but uh, uh, with regards to you know, all of the different nuances and, and findings from these trials, um, but based on the body of evidence that was growing with the fact that coronary CT was just as good um, as functional testing. Um, the Europeans updated their guidelines in 2019 and gave coronary CT a class one recommendation as initial test for evaluating coronary disease. And in fact, they further commented that in patients who had a lower likelihood of having obstructive coronary disease, coronary CTA was favored. And then in patients who had a higher likelihood of obstructive uh, disease, then functional testing was favored. And so finally, just last fall, um, our ACC and AHA guidelines updated uh, their, uh, their um, document about how to evaluate patients with chest pain. And coronary CTA was given a class one uh, recommendation in patients with both stable chest pain and in patients with acute chest pain. And they, they mirrored the Europeans in, in also saying that in younger patients and those with less suspicion for obstructive disease, that coronary CTA is favored. So that's uh, all the boring stuff. And, and so now we're gonna talk about some of, uh, uh, some of the cases that we've done. Um, you know, with regards to calcium scores, I'm, I'm actually gonna skip calcium scores for this talk. I'll leave it to some of our lipidologists to maybe talk about how they used it in, in a primary prevention um, uh, talks in the future. Um, but one of the, the things that I hope you guys will take away from this talk is that um, coronary CTA is, has moved above and beyond just being a, a test to evaluate the coronary arteries. And I think it's a, a, a test that is applicable to multiple disciplines, uh, even within cardiology. But we'll start with the coronaries. So this is a 48-year-old male with a history of hypertension who went to the ER for chest pain. He was sent there by his PCP. This is a 3D reconstruction of his coronaries. And in a second here, I will uh, cut down and focus in on the coronary tree. And so this is uh, what we use to evaluate the coronaries. This is his RCA. This is what we call a curved NPR. And you can see that it's a big vessel um, with its grossly normal. Um, here is a LAO cranial projection of the RCA, and here's the corresponding uh, coronary, invasive coronary angiogram. Uh, 
you can see that the RC is normal. Here is his circ. Pretty healthy looking vessel. Here is his ramus, which is actually a, a very large vessel. And there, there actually may be something there um, at the ostium. But the vessel of interest, the LAD, you can see here at this essentially trifurcation of a diag and a septal that there is a very tight and focal stenosis. So this is a RAO caudal uh, projection um, of his left system. And here is the corresponding angiogram. And you can see the tight LED right there. And so uh, actually FFR was done for this patient and it was very clearly uh, a significant lesion. Um, FFR of the ramus was also done and that was normal. This patient actually underwent a robotic lima um, and then is now recovering well. What I wanna show here is that um, we actually have the ability to do CT FFR as of literally two months ago. Uh, we went live at Midtown. And so this case we actually sent to the company that does CT FFR heart flow um, as a quality check. And you can see here that the CT FFR also calculated the FFR to be very significant at 0 0.54. And similarly, the ramus and the other vessels uh, were not significant, were not hemodynamically significant. So just two slides real quick on CTFFR. So what we typically do is we'll send our images, uh, our raw data to uh, HeartFlow, the company, um, and they will create their own 3D models and they'll use physiologic models to basically plug in all that information into these um, complex mathematical models and then create this um, color-coded uh, CTFFR diagram that they send to us in a PDF. There have been a number of studies over the last decade that have looked into, into validating CTFFR. And essentially, CTFFR correlates fairly well with invasive FFR. And it also improves the diagnostic accuracy of CTA alone. In fact, in those 2021 20, updated guidelines, CTFFR was given a 2A uh, in patients who have either, who have moderate stenosis on their coronary CT. Here's a second case, 67-year-old female, history of hypertension, comes to you in clinic and also has chest pain. Um, this patient was sent for a coronary CTA. This is not a standard um, view of, of for us to, look, to evaluate the coronaries, but I wanted to show it to kind of highlight. You can see that there's a bite taken out of the RCA right here. Um, this is uh, looking at the cross section of the vessel. Uh, so basically scrolling down from the proximal segment into the distal segment. And I'll play this again. The thing I want to highlight here is you can see this lumen start to get smaller and you see this low attenuation around it, which is a uh, soft plaque. So this patient, um, oh, here, here's a uh, RAO cranial projection of the RCA. You can kind of see a little divot here in the mid RCA as well. And here's the angiogram. So what was surprising about this case was that the angiogram looked far less concerning than what the CT did. And so it was called a 40% mid RCA, and I think they did an IFR on it just to try, to try to make me happy, and I think it actually made me less happy uh, to see that. But she was started on an aspirin and a statin nonetheless, and the statin's been up titrating uh, in clinic. And I wanted to show this case for a couple of reasons. So this study was done before we had the ability to do CTFFR. And we also sent this study to HeartFlow as a quality check afterwards. And you can see here that her CTFFR of the RCA was not hemodynamically significant. So if we had this ability before her study, or at the time of her study, you know, she could have avoided a cath. The other thing I want to highlight with the study, though, um, is that you know, if she had gotten a nuclear study or just a calcium score, the nuclear study would have probably showed no ischemia, and the calcium score would have probably been zero as well, but you would not have seen the, the soft plaque around her mid-RCA, and you may not have started her on an aspirin, a statin, and, and medical therapy, and so on and so forth. So there is, there is a utility of uh, coronary CTA um, in this case. Um, 
Next case, 66-year-old female who has had ongoing exertional dyspnea with a normal spect at an outside hospital. This is an LAO caudal, and you can see a big left system, tortuous vessels. And then the, the team spent some time trying to fish for the RCA. There were a number of root shots. I don't know how many cc's of contrast were used, but um, there was suspicion that the RCA was coming off of the left. And so this person was sent for a coronary CTA. And this is an LAO cranial of the coronary tree. And then I'll flip it over to what the LAO caudal looks like here in a second. And then I will freeze that. So you can see that she essentially has a single left main when all of her coronary arteries come off of it. So you have an, a non-dominant RCA. Um, you have, uh, and in fact, let me start this over again. And in fact, the, the marginals even come off of the LAD. So I thought that was a, uh, an interesting case to highlight. And so this, the first three cases are what we would consider you know, more bread and butter um, uh, studies uh, that I think any coronary CT program should be able to, to handle. What I wanna uh, start to show you guys now are some of the um, more novel applications of coronary CT. And so we've been lucky in that our CTO operators have been very enthusiastic about ordering coronary CT before uh, their PCI and, and for planning. So this is a 63-year-old male who had a recent, uh, actually had a, his CERC CTO opened up recently and then underwent a staged PCI to a known LAD CTO. And, and these images are courtesy of um, Nick uh, Shekeladze, um, who was actually an imaging fellow uh, two years ago. So uh, the interventionists can thank us for training him well. Um, but this is a 3D reconstruction of uh, his uh, coronary tree, and you can see that there's a chunk missing here in the mid LED. This is a curved multiplanar uh, uh, format of the LED, and you can see that the mid LED here is occluded. And one of the interesting things that we've noticed with CT is even with these CTOs, you can still see the outline of the vessel. And because of that, you can draw a center line through the vessel as such. And the reason that is helpful is because you can then take those center lines that you've drawn and make angiographic projections. And so here, Nick has basically drawn out where the proximal cap of the CTO is and where the distal cap of the CTO is. And he made this in an REO cranial projection to match up with the invasive coronary angiogram. And using this as a roadmap, the, our CTO operators can figure out where to basically put their wires. And so this is the final result, which looked great, and it looked like the patient's doing pretty well and is now angina-free. Well, what about fusing CT and fluoro directly, one on top of another, uh, of each other? So this is a, um, uh, a CT uh, where we've highlighted um, a portion of the IVC and a portion of the aorta, and then we fuse that with the live fluoro. And here, what we've done is we drew two little dots, one in the IVC and one in the aorta, as basically uh, the location where it would be safe to do transcable uh, access in, in the patient who was needed to get a TAVR. And you can see the wire in the IVC crossing over into the aorta where it's being snared. Now, I will say, you know, um, truthfully, this, there's, there's still a lot of kinks that we're still trying to work out with the CT fluoro fusion, but you can see um, some of the potential uh, utility of this in the future. All right, so that was, that was um, some of the cases for coronary CTA. What about for cardiac structure and morphology? So we'll start off with um, some cases that might interest some of our EP guys and gals. Um, first of all, this is, um, I just wanna show you how easy it is to image the left atrial appendage. You can see how clearly you can see all of the pectinate. And this is the Coumadin ridge with the left upper pulmonary vein. And so, um, you know, there's been this movement towards using CT to clear the appendage before cardioversion, 
before ablation. And here's an example of someone who has a clear filling defect in the tip of their left atrial appendage that would be representative of a clot. So um, how does CT compare to TEE uh, for left atrial appendage rule out? There was a meta-analysis from a couple of years ago that actually showed that it is actually very good um, with 100% sensitivity and 99% specificity. Now, I will say that none of these were randomized control trials. There is one um, ongoing RCT comparing CT versus TEE, but my guess is, is that it's probably going to show that CT is non-inferior, in which case I think we'll see a lot more CTs before um, their procedures. Now, um, this is more specific to, uh, like I said, our, our, our EP guys and gals and, and also our structuralists who do watchmans. So with our software, we can actually get a better understanding of the 3D uh, morphology and the anatomy of the left atrial appendage. And from this, we can actually draw out where we think the landing zone of the watchman should be and then make our measurements and get you know, accurate measurements of the size of, the, of what watchmen should be used. Um, from there, we can help uh, create and, and uh, figure out the fluoro angles uh, where you can see the, um, uh, the landing zone uh, coaxial, um, where you can see the tip of the appendage for where they're going to put their catheter, and also define a view where uh, the left atrial appendage is not foreshortened. on both fluoro and on 3D. We can also help figure out where to cross the septum. So again, this is, uh, so here's another uh, angiographic uh, overlay where you have the SVC, you have the IVC, you have the septum drawn out, you have the appendage here with a couple of landing zones that I've created, and then you can put in a virtual catheter um, through the IVC into the, or sorry, in the IVC through the septum and then into the left atrial appendage with the catheter tip or the catheter pointing to the tip of the appendage. And then just to double check, we can create the corresponding echo views where we have essentially the bicable. This is the IV, this is the SVC IVC coming in. And you can see, I'll just rewind here and rewind right here. You can see where this is crossing the septum, and it's on the inferior aspect of the septum in this view. Now I can rotate the picture and create the short axis of the septum, where you have your aortic valve here. And so this is the anterior side of the septum, the posterior side of the septum, and you see this catheter crossing along the posterior aspect of the septum. And so for this patient, what we recommended was that we stick uh, inferior and posterior uh, to get into the septum, or to get across the septum. Now, this, is a, this next uh, image here is something that we just uh, recently started doing, which I'm very excited about. But we can actually create TEE images from our CT. So in this case, I've basically put in a virtual TE probe. And here, you can basically see uh, what the TE would look like. So here, I'm, I basically anaflexed. I countered the probe like you normally would, and then I zoomed in here, and you can see the appendage pop out. Now I can go up on my TEE angle to 45, which is a standard view for these uh, Watchman cases. And I'm just gonna optimize the picture here a little bit. I'm gonna anaflex a little bit more to open up the appendage, and now you can see the catheter in there as well. And now I can explain with CT through the appendage through at the 45, which then gives you the corresponding 135. And from here, um, we can make measurements the same way that we would do on TEE of the size of the appendage without ever doing a TEE. Now, I want you to remember what the 135 and the 45 uh, looks like on this picture, because this next slide shows the actual TEE and the shape and morphology of the appendage is identical. And the, the measurements that were made on TEE were also very comparable to CT. CT typically uh, will um, give you a slightly larger uh, numbers, and I think it's that TEE tends to underestimate rather than CT overestimating. What about after the watchman goes in? Well, traditionally, 
um, you know, the patients will get a follow-up TEE at the uh, six-week mark to look for leak. But if you think about it, these patients are essentially getting uh, a TEE a few weeks before their procedure, an intra-op TEE, and then a TEE six weeks afterwards. They're essentially getting three TEEs in the span of about two months. And these are typically older men and women who are getting a watchman, usually for GI bleeding, um, that you're doing three TEs on in, in, a, in a short period of time. So what if we use CT to rule out any sort of leak after their uh, watchman? And there's a lot, a lot less written about this, um, but um, some, of the, some of the earlier studies that basically show that it's, it's actually um, uh, comparable to TEE. And so here are two examples from uh, Emory where you see that there's no contrast filling beyond the watchman, so this would be a successful closure. I actually could not find any leaks uh, that we've done here at Emory, because I guess we're, we're so good. Um, but so I had to go online and find an example of a peri device leak where you can see that there's an entire lobe uh, uncovered there. So my guess is, is you know, there's also obviously um, uh, trials looking at this, um, uh, but my guess is, is that we're probably gonna move more and more towards CT for uh, left atrial appendage and for Watchman's uh, in the future. All right, now here's, here's the next section hopefully will interest uh, basically anyone who, who reads ECHO here. Um, as I've already kind of shown you guys earlier, we can use CT to create um, ECHO, uh, the corresponding ECHO images. And so here I'm basically creating a, a four chamber, a two chamber, and a short axis. And I can play this, and we can get a good look at both LV and RV size and function. And you can see how clearly you can see the endocardium, which you can't always see on echo very well, to get a sense for what uh, wall motion may look like. Um, and then the volumes on CT uh, do correlate with uh, MRI. So this is obviously someone who had a normal EF. What if someone who doesn't have a normal EF, what does that look like? So this is a 70-year-old female who is in cardiogenic shock after a STEMI. Let me show you her echo pictures first, which are, um, she had difficult windows. Um, and you can see that there's an, uh, an impella uh, across the aortic valve. But to get a sense for you know, how deep the impella is and the relationship of the, you know, the inlet with the rest of the LV, I think it's hard to figure out from this echo. So this patient got a CT. And again, I'm lining up my crosshairs to create, um, in this case, I'll create a three chamber. I'll create a two chamber and then a short axis. And you can see very clearly now that this patient had a huge basal to mid inferior wall aneurysm. You can see that here in the two chamber. You saw it there on the short axis. And then from this, you can also very easily appreciate wall motion. The basal, the mid anterior wall looks okay. Apical anterior wall is hypokinetic. The apex is dead. The inferior wall is dead. Um, the, but the anterior lateral wall and the infralateral wall were okay. The other thing, which you've already seen, is she has an impella. And using CT, we can also very clearly get an idea of how the impella is sit sitting in the heart and how deep the impella is. And so, you know, from this, it looks like the impella is actually parallel to the mitral valve annulus pointing towards the infralateral wall, and in fact, the pigtail is curling down into the aneurysm. And we can measure um, the depth of the impella with this as well. And for a 5.0, this is a transcable 5.0, uh, you know, 5.5 centimeters is probably a little bit deep. The other thing I wanna show with this is if you turn your attention to this 3D model, is I can cut out all of the soft tissue and basically just leave any kind of metal left. And you can see how the impella is actually moving uh, in the heart right here across the aortic valve. And this right here is, uh, I think that was a swan. All right, what about in valvular heart disease? So this is an 82-year-old male who had an Ivor Lewis esophagectomy, which I found in about three minutes before we did the TEE. Um, but it's essentially uh, where uh, right thoracotomy is performed and the uh, the esophagus is resected, and the stomach is basically pulled out uh, and, and is now on the right side of the chest. So 
we, we didn't think we were gonna get great T images, and uh, we were right, they were terrible. Uh, and in fact, you could probably see the rugae of the stomach uh, better than you could see the mitral valve leaflets. But when we put color on, you could get a, a glimpse of this patient having probably significant MR, we just couldn't uh, uh, evaluate that further, despite Dr. Lisko's best efforts. So one of the things uh, we can do with CT, which I've already shown you guys with the appendage, is why don't we make a TEE reconstruction? So um, here we have our virtual TEE probe. Uh, I think I just moved the TEE probe to the left a little bit, so basically the small wheel. And then here I'm gonna, so there's the, the TEE probe moving to the left. Here I'm going to retroflex the probe, and then counter. And here I've basically created the four chamber that you would typically see on TEE. And I can play this and get a sense for what the mitral valve leaflets are doing. Now I'm gonna increase the angle of my virtual TE probe and get to a commissural view. And I'm gonna open up the LV a little bit more. And I'm gonna explain through the BICOM and that will create our LVOT view. And now if I zoom in a little bit and play, you can see that the posterior leaflet is restricted and the anterior leaflet is overriding. So this person had functional MR. Another case, 80-year-old male, progressive shortness of breath. This is a parasternal long by TTE. I apologize for the pictures. The, the, they didn't turn out a lot grainier than I uh, anticipated. This looks more like a, uh, an echo board uh, echo. Um, but you know the aortic valve, didn't look like it was opening. And with color, you know, it looks like there was turbulence across the leaflets. So um, this echo was read as an EF of 35 to 40% with a low stroke volume, a calculated aortic valve area of 0 0.9. However, the mean gradient was only 16 millimeters of mercury. So should we taver this person or not? So what we did was we did a CT. Um, and we did a calcium score of the aortic valve. I guess I lied earlier when I said we weren't gonna talk about calcium scores, but of the aortic valve. Um, and you can see, uh, once this plays, that the aortic valve, I'm gonna pan down now, the aortic valve was very calcified with a calcium score of over 3,000. So the guidelines basically say that uh, aortic valve calcium score of over 2,000 for a male um, is suggestive of severe aortic stenosis. The other thing is with CT, we can much more clearly see the valve leaflets. So this is the right, I'm uh, sorry, the left cusp, the right, and the non, and I'll just play that one more time here. And the non coronary cusp is completely fixed. And at um, mid systole, we can also planimeter the residual aortic valve area with CT. And we're getting an aortic valve area of 0 0.9. And so this person um, has classic low flow, low gradient AS, and got a TAVR. Here's a case of a 71-year-old female who had a 23 millimeter Sapien 3 TAVR, so she already had a TAVR. <clears throat> Here's her parasternal long, the LV looks normal. You don't really see the, the TAVR valve uh, leaflets very well. With color, there's nothing obvious uh, that's abnormal. But she had a peak velocity across her TAVR valve of 3.5. Uh, meters per second and a mean gradient of 24 millimeters of mercury, both of which are technically uh, elevated. But her other echo metrics uh, were within normal limits, including her dimensions index, her acceleration time, her aortic valve area. And so why are, her, uh, uh, why are her velocities and gradient elevated? Well, we did a CT just to take a look at the TAVR valve. And so I showed you, you know, being able to look at the leaflets of native valves, we can also see the leaflets of prosthetic valves. You can see here that the leaflets of her TAVR valve in this long axis of view are thin and they open up pretty nicely. We can also look at the leaflets uh, in the short axis view up here and you can see the three leaflets opening and closing uh, pretty unrestricted. So this patient, what happened was she had a normal TAVR but she was admitted with a GI bleed and had a hemoglobin of six and she, she probably had high flow causing her elevated gradients because of her anemia. In contrast, here's an example of someone who does not have normal TAVR leaflets. This person had uh, leaflet thrombosis, just as a, 
uh, a comparison. All right, so moving on. I'm not gonna, we don't have the time to, to go through an entire tab of workup or anything like that, and I also don't wanna bore you guys to sleep with that. But what I wanna show you is in addition to understanding the anatomy of the aortic valve and figuring out what size of valve to put in for a TAVR, we can also use CT um, to assess for risk of complications from TAVR, and in particular, coronary obstruction. And so we can place various uh, types of prosthetic valves. In this case, that was, the first one was a core valve. This is a, a sapien valve. And we can set the size of the valve, and we can see the relationship between the virtual valve and here, the left main ostium. And so in patients where uh, you know, this distance is short, this is someone who might um, be at risk for coronary obstruction. Similarly, in the mitral side, this is someone with severe MAC. We can place a TAVR valve inside of the MAC. And then as you can see very easily that if you put a valve in this lady, you will completely block her LVOT. And so this is someone who was at very high risk for LVOT obstruction, so this is someone that uh, we're planning to do a lampoon on. We also use CT to look for paravalvular leak of prior mechanical and prosthetic valves. This is someone with a mechanical mitral valve. So if, actually, you can also see the, the leaflets open and close uh, pretty normally. But in this particular case, what I wanted to highlight was that there's a gap between the valve and the mitral valve uh, annulus and that is paravalvular leak. And so we can measure the size of that leak uh, to, to plan our PVL closure. And in this case, this person actually had two different leaks that we picked up on CT. So I've, I've since I rotated the image a little bit to get you basically a CT uh, surgeon's view. And then here is the actual surgeon's view on TEE. And here is that with color. And you can see two leaks that correspond exactly in the location of where we found on CT. All right, so the last uh, part of this, um, I just want to give you an overview of the infrastructure of our CT program at Emory. Um, there is a lot of heterogeneity across our sites with regards to the CT scanner, with regards to the text, the readers, and the reading software. And so at Midtown, um, CTs are read only by cardiology, our cardiac CTs are only read by cardiology. At Clifton, it's a combination of cardiology and radiology. St. Joe's, it's cardiology. Grady and the VA, it's only radiology. And then um, Emory Decatur, they actually committed to uh, a scanner. Um, and, uh, you know, Ankit Bargava, who we trained in imaging last year, um, I'm sure will make us proud and, and lead that. Um, and I think Emory, uh, Johns Creek is probably a couple years away from uh, cardiac CT. The other thing I wanted to show you guys was um, how our volumes of CT have changed over time. So this is uh, just at Midtown, um, but our dedicated CT scanner uh, became operational in April of 2019. And you can see that our growth and our volume of CT has increased significantly. I put PET and SPEC there um, as references, and I got rid of the, I got rid of the y-axis, and so in case there were some uh, sensitive numbers uh, uh, there. But um, uh, you know, so our, our volume has has uh, increased uh, very nicely, and with that, um, let me actually go back one more. So um, obviously, this corresponded to our structural program moving to Midtown. But I will say that you know, initially when we first started, we were probably only doing about maybe one coronary CT a day. And at least anecdotally speaking, um, at least for calendar year 2022, it seems like we're doing four to five coronary CTs a day. So I think the word has gotten out there and I think people are enthusiastic about it. Um, but, and, and I appreciate uh, you guys all ordering more coronary CTs from both internally and from uh, a lot of these outside referrals. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to mention was that we, we're actually getting to the point where we're seeing a lot of patients who probably aren't the best candidates for coronary CT coming to us for coronary CT. And I just want to highlight a couple of things because I would hate to keep sending patients either back or giving non-diagnostic results. 
So the three probably biggest killers for coronary CT um, are heart rate, BMI, and calcium score. And a lot of practices will only do coronary CT in patients who are in sinus rhythm with a slow resting heart rate of less than 65, with a BMI of less than 40, and a calcium score of less than 400. We are pushing those limits at Midtown. Um, I think we are learning more about how to get the most out of our scanner, and I think we're doing a pretty good job. And so we've you know, upgraded some of these limits, and none of these are absolute thresholds, but you know, if you have someone who has a BMI in the 50s, who also has a high resting heart rate, who also has calcium, we're probably not gonna get you a good result. And uh, I think I have three minutes left to um, uh, show you that in patients who have a high resting heart rate, this is what happens. You get these terrible motion artifacts and you can't see the coronaries. And patients who have a high calcium score, this is someone with a calcium score of 2,900, of which is in the LED alone, calcium causes a blooming artifact and we can't see around it to look at the lumen of the vessel. And then this is someone with, who was 5'5", 360 pounds and the BMI of 57, and this is what happens with their CT. The entire thing looks washed out. It doesn't look like there's, a, you, can't, you can barely tell what uh, has contrast in it and what doesn't. Um, in conclusion, um, you know, there's, I think, significant growth potential for cardiac CT. We're seeing an increasing volume of coronary CT, but I, um, I hope that this talk shows you that cardiac CT is more than just coronary CT. And I think there is um, uh, a utility of using CT across all of our um, cardiology specialties. Obviously, I didn't have enough time to cover everything. I obviously did not talk about you know, using cardiac CT in the congenital population. I didn't talk about myocardial perfusion imaging with CT. Um, we're doing some uh, cool things with our EP colleagues with uh, uh, localizing uh, for VT ablation, um, and then also for uh, venous anatomy. Um, and then a couple of things that are on the horizon. <coughs> so there's this move towards, uh, or there's a company that's using uh, basically AI uh, to look at and to predict, uh, uh, you know, which plaques are significant, and they focus a lot on uh, the atherosclerosis and the plaque density and the plaque morphology uh, as, a, as a form of basically moving towards, you know, precision medicine. Um, there are only a few sites that have an actual CT scanner in their hybrid lab where you can do a structural procedure, basically push the patient to the CT scanner, do the CT, and then figure out if, whether it's a watchman or, or the valve that you put in um, is in the appropriate position. And then the last thing is uh, this concept of photon counting, which is essentially the next generation of CT. Um, it's supposed to revolutionize uh, the way that we do CT and provide these um, awesome pictures uh, that Siemens uh, has developed. And hopefully, uh, Emory can get their hands on one. So I um, uh, want to just thank uh, my colleague, uh, Patrick, and our structural team. You know, Patrick obviously trained me uh, imaging a couple of years ago and then also convinced our structural team to hire me. Um, and then I want to thank our, uh, our great uh, CT techs at Midtown, Derek and Will. And then we nowadays have probably three imaging fellows uh, at any given day working with us and screening the patients and doing the workup. And, um, and they're, they're working their butts off. Uh, as you can see, our, our program has gotten quite busy. And with that, any questions? Yes. I have a couple of questions. So um, first is, what's the turnaround now for the FFRs on CT? I mean, it used to be a couple of days. Is it still yeah. that long? Yeah. So good question. So um, uh, it's a few hours now, probably about six hours. Uh, now, certainly, if you order it at 5 PM, you're probably going to get it you know, the next day. Mm -hmm. There is an option for, for um, either ER patients um, or patients for whom you're, you're pretty concerned about what you saw on the CT to basically do an expedited review. Um, I think Emory probably has to cough up a little bit more money to get that to happen. Um, but um, you, that turnaround is two hours. And then this, the second question was, as I was 
You showed the CTO with, you could still see the vessel. Is that sort of a trickle luminal flow? Is that adventitial flow or is that calcium? How, how can you still Probably see Probably a combination of all of those things uh, is my guess. Um, the, a lot of them will have a lot of calcification that will kind of give you uh, a roadmap. Um, but I, I, the reason I showed that case was because there wasn't that much calcium. You could still see the outline of the vessel, but it's probably a combination of all those things. If I can, uh, the, the one holdup uh, on the CTFFR <clears throat> in some cases is actually the, uh, the insurance and pre-certification. Um, so if, if, you're, if we've said in the report that we're going to do a CTFFR and you haven't seen it, um, come back, that, then certainly let us know because sometimes that, that is the, the main hang up and that can take a day or two. Now we've, we've decided to just go ahead and send them after 24 to 48 hours if we haven't gotten that, but that's a hospital kind of hang up for us. But <clears throat> as he said, that they, they will come back in usually about three or four hours um, with that. But uh, with regard to the, the CTO, one of the things that, that we're able to take advantage of is that <clears throat> the coronaries are always traveling in the epicardial fat. And so the, the Hounsfield uh, units of that is about negative 100. And then the, the plaque that's inside is, a, is usually about, you know, uh, somewhere in the 50 to 60 range. So, so, so that gives us enough differentiation if, if we've got a good scan to, to see the, the vessel traveling um, through there. So uh, I have a, a, a quick question for you. So, you know, the, the chest pain guidelines, as you talked about, came out this past fall. There was some controversy uh, surrounding them in that they gave uh, the coronary CTA a 1A recommendation, um, and then they gave nuclear a 1B recommendation. And, and the, the nuclear society was actually the, the only imaging society not to endorse the, the guidelines because of that, because they, they said that all nuclear testing was lumped in, into one, um, whereas PET and, and SPECT were, were together. So, you know, at a site like Emory, where we, where we do have a great pet program at, at Clifton and at Midtown. Uh, how do you, what, what would your recommendation be to, to you know, the, the cardiologists that are ordering the test as far as when, you know, pet versus uh, coronary CTA would, would be kind of uh, the optimal test? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with you in that um, a lot of those CT papers that I showed uh, were comparing CT to standard of care, which was mostly SPECT stress echo, and just plain old ETT. Um, and so there wasn't a large number of patients who had cardiac PET, and certainly I, I agree with you in that um, our cardiac PET program at Midtown is, and here, uh, are, are both um, uh, phenomenal. Um, so I, I think uh, my, the way I would approach it would be similar to uh, you know, one of the caveats that the, the guidelines mention, and that is in patients who are younger, who have a lower uh, likelihood of having obstructive disease, I think coronary CT is probably the test that I would order first. And then in patients who have um, more, who have a higher likelihood of obstructive disease, I would probably reach for PET. The other thing to keep in mind is um, from an insurance standpoint. So um, for United Healthcare, um, uh, CT is actually what they consider to be their first line. Um, and then uh, with Blue Cross Blue Shield, they used to block all of our coronary CTs because they were also they required the site to have the ability to do CTFFR, and now we do, and so now you know anyone I, anyone with Blue Cross Blue Shield we order CT it goes right through, and so I, I don't know if it's harder uh, for PET to get approved versus SPECT. Uh, yes. So the correlation between uh, CTFFR. Is, is pretty good as, as you've shown the correlation between it, uh, the uh, invasive and non invasive FFR. But uh, as far as the overall management of the patient, uh, FFR has taken a bit of a hit lately with several studies that uh, don't really show that you're getting a much better outcome, uh, both in acute syndromes and in stable and FAME 3 and, and uh, the other, other studies. So uh, how much uh, emphasis should we be putting on this whole idea of, of uh, the extra expense and so forth of getting the, uh, getting it in? How is it going to change the, the uh, management of the patient? Yeah, good question. Um, the, the short answer is 
there aren't very many studies that have actually looked at the downstream implications of CTFFR and the clin or the clinical implications of of CTFR in, in terms of you know uh, revascularization rates, death, MI, those sort of things. Um, and so right now, uh, really the, the studies are are basically just looking at the diagnostic accuracy uh, compared to invasive FFR. Uh, but some of those downstream uh, consequences are not well teased out. Um, and then the other thing is that CTFFR actually has not been uh, compared to uh, uh, the ischemia burden from a normal, from a SPECT or from a PET, or basically from nuclear imaging. So that correlation hasn't really been established yet either. Should I follow up with one more question? Uh, so Emory has some really fancy, nice machines. A lot of the patients, I guess, are referred from somewhere. So still for the patient with some kind of a chest pain or positive exercise test or whatever, in their workup, they they've, say they're coming out of uh, South Georgia somewhere. And they, so what does the doctor tell them? I'm sending you to Emory for this. What I'm getting at is I, I talked to someone who runs a lot of uh, imaging centers. And in the past, they said, yeah, this is great if you, you know, you, you could go out and just like you get your CT of everything else uh, in an imaging center and then the report sent off and it's no big deal. But with chest pain, uh, you know, you're being sent to a place where you may get stents, you may get surgery, you know, it's a huge deal. And uh, the guy said, well, you know, we run our imaging centers based on our, uh, on our, uh, uh, not on, not on our CT, but our uh, MR machines, because the reimbursement is, is no good. Is, is from the business aspect, is, is the uh, CT, uh, coronary CT, for instance, uh, keeping up with the, uh, is it going to be a, is it going to be widely available, or is it still going to be, you know, advanced centers doing it as a, I, I think m more, uh, you know, smaller community hospitals in rural parts of the, the state and part of the country will probably, I think they're all interested in having their own uh, dedicated cardiac CT scanner. But as you can, as I, I showed, there's, there's a lot of uh, infrastructure that needs to all already exist for that to happen. Uh, in addition to having, you know, just the CT scanner, you need the techs and the physicians and so on and so forth. Um, and it's expensive. Um, and so um, uh, I think these other places are interested. I don't know in reality um, how that will change over time. I think for the time being, we will still get, and we are getting a lot of patients from you know, south of Atlanta coming in for their coronary CT. Unless you had a, a, a system and you had a remote reading you know, from the experts, and you had, and you developed your own system, disseminated system, you could virtually eliminate, uh, I know the nuclear people are upset about it, but <laughs> you could basically uh, wipe out uh, spec, which would be a good thing. Well, we, we, we bet. <laughs> well, diagnostic cat, for sure you should wipe out. Yeah. The, um, the, the remote reading thing, I think, is a, is a good idea. Um, and we've talked about that. Um, we've, we've talked about, um, you know, kind of joining forces across all of our Emory sites and basically having basically like an on-call schedule for a CT reader of the day. And that way you can run coronary CTs, not just nine to five, but overnight from ER patients, uh, weekends and holidays. Um, but there's a lot of uh, challenges and logistical issues with that as well because of, you know, a mix of cardiology and radiology. Um, and, and also there's a lot of um, hands-on uh, fine-tuning that we sometimes have to do at the scanner. And if, you know, you have a, an ER patient with chest pain in the middle of the night, you know, what, getting a radiologist to go down there to, to you know, fine-tune that scan is going to be hard to do. Or a cardiologist, you know, for that matter, too. So, Joe, that was absolutely great. Thanks. Um, the availability on a kind of a routine basis. Uh, one commonly encounters uh, holdups from uh, 
prior approval, <laughs> which I, is a real pain. I would say it takes about three phone calls to get on the line with somebody that might give you an approval number. So uh, I think we've got to make progress with that. There are a ton of people out there with coronary calcium that, uh, that when you start looking at these, uh, you get into that intermediate zone that you talked about. A lot of our patients have a, a lot of coronary calcium, so that puts you in the category of using it for people who don't have much and uh, puts you in the nuclear category if they have a lot of coronary calcium. So, so uh, I like those comparison studies. So let me show you this, actually, um, now that you brought it up. I, have a, I, had a, I actually have a bunch of other images that I just didn't have time to, to share, but you, know, you brought up the, the calcium uh, score, essentially, issue. Um, and I showed you this one earlier in someone with a calcium score of 2,000. And so one of the reasons why I said that we've been increasing you know, our threshold for still scanning these patients with elevated calcium scores is this an example of someone with a calcium score of 995, of which 661 was in the LED. Um, but we've been able to get pretty decent uh, images. And um, you know, here I'm essentially windowing down. And you can see that despite all that calcium, uh, the lumen of the LED here is, is patent. Um, and then here is an example from just uh, a few weeks ago, calcium score of 1100, 530 in LAD, 228 in Aramis. This one is someone who has more of an intermediate stenosis. There are these big chunks of calcium, particularly on the plates again, big chunk of calcium at the ostium of the LED uh, and where that Aramis is coming off as well as here uh, further down in the LED. But one of the things that we did for this patient, go to the next slide, is you can run CTFFR in that as well. And it has been shown to work very well or just as well in patients who have coronary calcium. And you can see there that the FFR of the LED was not hemodynamically significant and the uh, CTFFR of that ramus was also not hemodynamically significant. Well, is it, uh, is it automatic to get the FFR if, you, uh, if there's some question about the lesion or not? No, so it's, it's up to the, essentially the reader. Uh, so the reader has that, to check the study to, immediately to, afterwards. To make that call, yeah. Do we do, th we do that or? So right now, the only site that has CTFFR is at Midtown, and so it's me, Patrick, or Stephanie uh, making that decision based on what the images look like. And, CTFFR has essentially been approved for, for a lesion percent stenosis of as low as 40% and as high as 80%. They essentially gave us this huge window to basically give us the flexibility to send these studies for a CTFFR as we see fit. Yep. Very good. There are three questions in the good. chat, so I'll just go through okay. them quickly. Um, First one was Dr. Kayumi's. Uh, approximately how many CCTAs are done across the three Emory hospitals? Um, I'm not sure, uh, to be honest. Um, I don't have the numbers for the other sites. Um, I can get them from Midtown uh, pretty easily. And like I said, as I showed earlier, um, uh, our coronary CT volume at Midtown has really taken off in the last few months. But I, I, I don't know uh, what it looks like here at Clifton uh, or at St. Joe's. Actually, I think at St. Joe's, they're probably doing about two, two coronary CTs uh, a day. Okay. And the second part of the question I think you answered was that we don't order the FFR part. Uh, you automatically decide whether it, that's needed or not the if it's yes, done at Yes, the CT reader uh, is, the one, is the person who uh, makes that call. Okay. Um, Dr. Devreddy has a comment and a question. A wonderful talk, Joe. How is the workflow for acute chest pain evaluation in the ED? Going with uh, CTFFR, any areas we need to focus on Emory Heart and Vascular standpoint? So the, the challenge with the ERs, because they, they want to get those patients in and out pretty quickly. And so, um, uh, you know, if you get ordered a CTFFR, you pretty much have to uh, do the expedited version. Now, the thing at Midtown, though, is that it's still very nuke heavy. And so the number, so those four or five corner CTs that we're doing at Midtown, Maybe one of those is an inpatient a day versus, you know, a lot more that are getting pets and specs. So we haven't encountered that in practice yet, but we probably will at some point and we'll have to figure it out. 
And then the last question by Dr. Babliaro's uh, comment. It is obvious that diagnostic heart cath will be replaced by CT. Question is, what is the best location for a cardiac CT scanner? Best location? <laughs> uh, you mean like in front of the cath lab? <laughs> Blocking the cath lab? <laughs> right next to the ED, maybe? Yeah, right next to the ER. Yeah. It is 8.30, so unless anybody else has any questions. Oh, Dr. Sherman has a comment. Still expensive for FFR and institutionally charge, institutions still charge less. I guess a comment on FFR, the cost. Uh, I know there's a set fee. I, I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, I, I don't know how much, uh, actually, Patrick. Yes. So uh, HeartFlow bills the hospital uh, $1,100 for each CTFFR. Um, and so that's why the, the, this pre-cert issue with, uh, is a hang up uh, for some of these people. Um, but uh, certainly a, still an expensive uh, test. And that, that cost has actually come down uh, as over the years. So. Okay, great. All right, thank you so much. That was fantastic. See you guys next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.